kind of why I'm starting this because, you know, there were everybody involved with Into the Mind Dungeon that I was seeing and speaking with and, and interacting with on uh, pretty much at least a weekly basis. And then uh, for the past four months or so, I've rarely, if at all, spoken with any of you. And yeah, uh, I got I got tired of that. So I started setting up the, the Zoom meetings um, for cast and crew to just to just chat. But it turns out that having, you know, six plus people on one of these chats is uh, not really conducive to any sort of a, a decent conversation. Uh, but it is good to at least see people's faces and, and say hi and whatnot. Uh, this one-on-one, -on -one, I think, was was definitely more appealing to me. So I was like, I'm going to reach out to everyone uh, on an individual basis. And then I was like, shit, what if I just record it and ask them some silly questions and call it a podcast? And that's uh, Influence and Dimash. Um, and, and I'm happy, Sean, that you were you are the first that I'm interviewing. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to release these in that order, but... Uh, you are the inaugural interview for Influence and, and Amash. Well, thank you for thinking of me for it. <laughs> thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of it. Uh, even though I know you were a little nervous about it, I was nervous too. I'm here with uh, Sean Driscoll, who has uh, I've, I've collaborated with on uh, many projects, uh, Penny Palabras. <laughs> Go the junkyard cat. Anyhow, these bandits are the biggest bunch of good for nothing thieves in this whole junkyard. Who's the con thieves, furball? <laughs> Enter the mind dungeon. When he started asking people to join his Vampire the Masquerade tabletop game, I was all in. How did that go? Yeah, it wasn't so much a game as it was just a bunch of us going to bars pretending to be vampires. I would want to describe usually someone as, say, like actor or writer, producer, director of photography, whatever it is. Um, but you've done so many different roles in our productions. What if, if you could pick one of those? Probably producer because that's the most overarching. OK, interesting, because I would have. So I, I did think that you were going to say writer. Um, that's probably the biggest uh, contribution I've made. So w this thing, this is, uh, what is it? It's making movies, right? It's producing. Yeah. It's writing. When uh, did you know that you wanted to do this? I've always been a fan of movies and television. I got into theater back in high school. Both my parents did theater when they were younger, and so I was kind of drawn to it naturally. And uh, I did that through high school and through college. After college, I just kind of fell out of it. Life got in the way. I was busy working and, you know, getting married, raising cats. And uh, eventually, I decided, you know, I, I got to do something with my, with my passions and with my creativity. And um, actually, a lot of it's thanks to you. <laughs> well, well, uh, uh, lift, well, good. I'm glad. It's, it's always been pretty important to me to... Uh, to make sure that other people are, are you know, doing what they got to do to stay alive. And uh, I, I firmly believe that art is necessary to, to stay alive. Maybe if not your physical body, your spirit. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that I could help you, you know, uh, achieve that. Yeah. You, you kind of like when I saw dead riff, I, I sort of realized. I guess who has two thumbs and isn't going to explode after all this guy right here. This is something that I could do too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Some of those that I know, like basically in my backyard. Right. Made, <laughs> yeah, in, in my backyard and in other people's backyards. Wow. Under the yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. It just, I mean, you can do it, right? Yeah. And if you can do it and, and you're a person that needs to do it, like you got to do it. That's, that's what that yeah, is. Exactly. So when you were doing this stuff and uh, you said you were in theater, involved in theater, uh, in, in, in college and whatnot, what, what kind of, uh, what was your involvement in the theater like? I did a little bit of everything there too. I, uh, I double the, what they had back in, in Carroll college where I went in Montana is they had two tracks 
that you could go to in theater. One was the like design and technical track. And then one was the acting directing track. I actually did both of those. Oh, nice. Instead of getting a minor, I just did both of those tracks and majored in like all around theater. Okay, cool. I I did um, a lot of acting. I did a lot of set work, hanging lights, uh, ran some sound and stuff. Uh, And I also got to direct a couple shows too. I got to direct a one act was one of my projects. And then my senior year, I got to direct uh, children's play. So you haven't really been involved in theater stuff lately, have you? No, I haven't. In fact, uh, Penny was probably the first creative thing that I've been involved with since college. Okay. Wow. Um, do you have, do you feel like a yearning or a pull to, to return to theater? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, kind of. I mean, I'm really more drawn towards filmmaking now. I don't know why. Just for some reason it, it feels more like where I should be. Okay. Interesting. I, and, I, and I often wonder why that is. Cause I know that I myself in my personal uh, adventures have sort of put other things on the shelf uh, in order to focus on the, the film and video side of things. And so I have, I have different uh, speculation as to why that is within myself. Um, I don't know. I think, I think part of it might just be the, the feeling of permanence. Right. Because when you do a play, it's like you get up there, you do it, you know, several dozen times, and then it's over. Right. You never do it again. But with a film, even when you wrap up production, it's still there. The work still exists. You can go back years later and watch what you did and go, wow, look what we did, man. Right. And I mean, I would actually argue that once you've wrapped production, the work has just begun. <laughs> like. <laughs> But yes, I, I absolutely get what you're saying. And, and that's, that's, I mean, that's huge, right? So in, in a play, you have a few nights of sort of this intense experience and then it's gone. And the right. only people that ever know about that particular specific experience are the people that were there. Because evil people, even people watching a, the same play performed by different people or the same play performed by people in a different time, the experience is never the same twice. So, right, there's, like, you know, that's part of the magic there, but you can't preserve it. Yeah, it's like if you see Shakespeare in the park in the summer, you're not having the same show that someone at the Globe Theater in, you know, 1432 or whatever was watching. Right, it's totally. Same words, same story, same characters, totally different experience. Yeah. I was going to say, I like theater, but I don't, like, make a habit. It's not, like, a thing that I do frequently. Like, probably the last probably the last two or three plays that I've been to have been when uh, Alyssa hits me up and says, hey, do you want free tickets to see this show uh, downtown Olympia? And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, literally the last three plays that I've shown, probably that I've seen, yeah. And there were a few before that, like, with a couple other actors and whatnot, but yeah. I want something that might live on after me. Mm. I want to make something that can be a legacy. You know what I mean? Something with my name on it that when I'm gone, people can look at and say, oh, this is what he did. Right. So so you really do think it's like a legacy thing? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Okay. I mean, I can can see that. Um, Although there may be a bit of a a nihilistic streak in me that, that, I mean, that thinks that on, you know, on a long enough timeline, uh, there is no legacy for anybody, yeah. you know? Um, so I've, I think that I've, but, but I mean, also with the advent of the internet and how, how much content is being made, how frequently, I think that it is increasingly unlikely that anything that I ever make will be remembered beyond me, if that makes sense. And I know that is kind of a fatalistic way of, of looking at it. But, but we don't know. We can't oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, Bach might not have known that his music could still be played 400 years later. Right. And at the end of the day, for me, I'm not necessarily doing this. So I'm not, I'm not doing this because I want it to be a legacy. I think that that might have been a component for me at some point uh, in my life, but legacy is no longer 
what this is about for me. This is more about, like I said before, like this is just something I have to do to be alive. Like, yeah. Um, because I went through a time, like you were talking about after college, between college, between the end of college and Penny Palabras, you didn't really have a creative outlet. And for me, I went through a similar phase. It was a couple of years where uh, I used to do a, a public access sketch comedy TV show from like 1997 all the way to 2003. Well, I stopped doing it in 2003 and I had very limited creative outlets that I was, that I was indulging in. And after like two years, I was like, I'm going to go crazy if I don't make something. Um, yeah. And then shortly after that, I, I started, uh, you know, writing scripts and put together a team and we started making some short films. Um, and that was probably in 2008 or nine, but yeah, it's like, I, th I think art is a survival mechanism, man. That, that gap of time where I didn't really do much of anything was just a long stretch of blah in my life. You know, I had a lot of good things that were happening otherwise, but it was kind of a dead spot for me, you know? I didn't right. feel like I was growing at all. And it sort of went by really quick. So I think what, what got me back into being creative was I started writing again. And then once those ideas started coming, I had more of a drive and more of a passion to get involved. And then watching, you know, something like Dead Drift and seeing a community around me that was also creating, I was like, I need to be a part of that. Um, over the course of the next 10 years, what kind of things do you see yourself doing? Uh, I'd, I'd kind of like to do some like sci-fi or fantasy stuff. That's kind of always been my, my favorite genre, my wheelhouse. I'd like to see, uh, it takes, you know, a lot of time and money to do stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you see stuff like Zombie Orpheus. They do it, you know, relatively cheap. They don't have a Hollywood budget and their stuff is pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. They make, they make great stuff. <laughs> you can do it. Why not me? Why not us? All right. So let's talk about the weather, Sean. Sweet. What's something you would want uh, people to know about you? I'd probably tell them that uh, I hate talking about myself. <laughs> 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 I want them to know I'm a total badass, but whether or not I am, is, I guess up to their judgment. What kind of, what kind of badass? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean define total badass? <laughs> That's just how I wish I could see myself. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, do you have like a, are you like a jujitsu dude or something? Oh man, I wish. No. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, we don't always get to do the things that we want to do. Um, so what is something, a skill or a hobby or an interest that you um, felt the need to let go of in order to make time for the rest of life? And it sounds like that for quite a while, it was all of this. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's the big one. Um, that's why I feel lucky to be involved in this now and in filmmaking now, because I'm finally getting to use that outlet and be creative again. Um, I guess another thing that, uh, that I kind of wish that I'd made time for or that I'd, you know, been able to do, I'd always wanted to be part of a metal band. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, like I, I even have like lyrics and stuff written. Oh, nice. <laughs> that, uh, and uh, I was kind of in a band, like a little garage band back in high school for like a minute. Um, but that kind of didn't go anywhere. Okay. So high school kids, we couldn't get our shit together. Yeah, right. Um, I know how that is. <laughs> right. Um, but I kind of wish that I might have uh, done something with that since then. Well, it is never too late to make fucking kick-ass music, dude. Yeah, that's true. Like, never, ever too late. Uh, I actually just, uh, part of what inspired me to write that question was I used to play guitar, and I was in uh, a handful of, you know, crappy little bands in my early, you know, high school and early 20s, none of which ever went anywhere. Um, but at some point, 
in the last 20 years, I stopped playing guitar. Um, and within the last month, I have picked it up again. Oh, nice. Um, and, and it's great. I love it. It's like I didn't even realize how much it had been missing uh, from my life. I, I kept one of my guitars, um, a guitar that I really love, just because, like, I thought one day, you know, maybe I'll play this again. And, uh, yeah, I've been playing and uh, do the vibrations that make you – uh, continue on in some compa capacity after your body functions cease, or is that the end of Sean Driscoll? Nope, that's pretty much it. That's it, huh? Yep. Oh man, and were you were uh, I believe were you raised Catholic? Um, yeah, I was raised lapsed Catholic. Okay. Like we went to church on Easter and Christmas, you know, like the big holidays, but we didn't go like every Sunday. You know, it wasn't drilled into our heads, but gotcha. it was definitely presence in our life so so you didn't have kind of the uh evangelical uh, you're gonna burn in hell forever if you don't you know follow these rules uh, kind of stuff not okay. from my parents no my my aunt got pretty bad when she well, got older good. i didn't get it from my parents but i got it from multiple churches weird stuff to yeah. uh to tell to children right yeah all right then since uh you believe that that's it man how do you uh how do you keep uh, that uh, existential dread uh, away from you so that you can enjoy your days? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, simply put, I, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't dwell on it. I don't think about it all the time. Right. It's just the thing that when it does come up and I do start thinking about it, I'm like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> but I just, I don't want to focus on it. You know, like, if this is all we have, then we have to make it count. We have to live for now, you know, and it's, it's nice to think about having a legacy that'll live on, but you got to make that now. And I, and I think as I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize that more and more because, you know, like however young we are now comparatively, we only have so much time left yeah. and we don't know how much time that's going to be. So we could just, Got to do something with what we have. And I think that's not just a professional thing. I think that's a personal thing too. You know, like we have to be good to each other. If we don't treat each other well, who will? This is yeah. all there is. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Uh, if this is the time we have, the moments are precious. So I was reading recently uh, that there is a mechanism within our brains that makes it so that we view our own inevitable demise uh, as an abstract that doesn't really affect us. Um, and that's like apparently a necessary mechanism in our psychology for us to be functional humans is that we have to see death as kind of something that affects other people and not us. Yeah. Uh, but then you have the, you know, the Stoics, who uh, memento mori it's like you can really only lead a full and effective life if you if you live with you know in mind the fact that you will die yeah I, I think it's kind of a balance i think it's something that it's good to remember every so often but you can't live in death that's how we got goths isn't it Oh, goth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Like Edgar Allan Poe, the first goth, and then all the goths that came since. Yeah, I used to hang out with a bunch of them in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had some goth friends, too. Sort of my crowd, yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then steampunk came around because I think somebody at some point introduced goths to the color brown. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and steampunk was born. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some crossover there. Yeah, there is absolutely. I and I, I'm, I, I kid. I have no issues with goths or steampunk aficionados. I, I like, I like geeks and nerds and weirdos of all stripes. I still listen to Typo Negative to this day. Oh my goodness! All right, man. Well, let's talk about our thing. The way we met is because we worked together at the hotel. You know, I'd seen your your dead drift posters up in the break room actually, and that's when I first heard about that, and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so I looked up, 
And I started watching it. And I'm like, dude, this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I know this guy who made this, man. So, uh, yeah, that's how I kind of got introduced to that little world. Well, that's awesome, man. I didn't even realize when I hung those posters, I'm like, no one's going to watch this, but I got to try, right? So I'm glad yeah, someone man. watched it based on the poster. What was your favorite part of Enter the Mind Dungeon? I probably had just have to say the cast. Because, like, all those little moments when we were filming, we, we had a great script. It, it is a wonderful script. But when you see them take that and then, like, run with it in these 20-minute ad-libs and just go all over the place, you get some freaking gems that you never thought you'd see. It, it was pretty amazing. It was fun to watch all that unfold. Absolutely, man. That's And that's one of my favorite parts of, of the filmmaking thing is that your uh, your final product isn't – one person's vision, at least not the way that, that we do it. Um, and I imagine not the way that most people do it, unless there's a, a tyrant auteur who controls every aspect uh, of things. But I, I think personally, it's much more rewarding when I get to be surprised by what an actor does with things that I wrote. Like that's serendipitous, man. Yeah. Yeah, and honestly, when I was directing, that's how I approached my actors, too. It's like, well, this is what's in the script. This is the way, you know, I see it. What are you bringing to the table? Right, yeah, fucking A. Show me, show me, how, show me what you see here. If your idea is better than mine, we'll go with that. Yeah. So simple. Well, that's awesome. We yeah, we had a, we had a cast stellar cast for Mind Dungeon. Yeah, we got, we got lucky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's time for influence and homage. So tell me about a piece of art that touched you, changed you, and the way you look at the world. I think any art that speaks to us does that. So it's kind of hard to pick, like, you know, one thing. Um, if I go way back, I think probably something that helped shape my worldview as a child, especially, was Sesame Street. Oh, Shit, good answer, man. Well, um, you know, you think about it, like, the the core of what I took away from that show was caring for others, being part of, you know, this world community that we live in, regardless of what we look like or where we live or who we live with, and uh, and just to take care of each other and respect each other. And uh, I think the other lesson that I learned from that is to just keep learning. There's always something new to learn, whether it's a new letter or number or whether it's the theory of, I don't know, solipsism or <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> to go back to that the whole thing. I mean, we all um, go through our solipsism phases. Study Nietzsche or Jung or whatever. Or at least I believe <laughs> most children went through solipsism a bit right or you know it could be a you know the theory of gravity or whatever like there's always something to, to learn about right no absolutely always i mean i don't ever want to stop learning man i i that's that's a a life goal for me is that i don't i don't ever want to be not learning new things whether it's history or a language or a skill uh, doesn't matter. I need, I need to be learning something and I need to be doing something just like, yeah. I think that's for me, that's kind of the gift and the curse of ADD is because I'm always getting distracted by something else and reading about this or finding out about that. And it's like, Oh, I'm learning things. <laughs> I keep being taken away from what I'm actually trying to do. <laughs> right. Like, well, now I know all these things, but I haven't finished what I was working on. Yeah, that's one of the traps in writing is that you could start researching stuff and, and go down research oh, yeah. rabbit holes instead of actually writing. Um, but yeah, I think with, with discipline, that can be overcome. And I, I got to the point where sometimes when writing, uh, the, the, I, you get to something where you like you hit flow state and you're writing and it's awesome. And then you're like, oh, I wonder if uh, this could work this way. So you, you open up 
another browser window and you, and you start doing some, some research. And then next thing you know, uh, you started researching whether or not police cars in the 1940s had um, blue lights on top of them. And the next thing you know, you're, you're reading about Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe. And, and that's, just, that's just how it goes. All right. So tell me about three artists that influenced you. Well, I mentioned Chris Cornell before. I think, uh, I think Soundgarden, like for music, really influenced me because I kind of discovered that at a time in my life. Where, it, where things were really dark and uh something about that just kind of grabbed me about their music it 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 helped me feel like i wasn't alone in feeling what i felt and that kind of helped me process and deal with my emotions you know and, and teenage years are hard on everybody but i think they're harder for some than others yeah, they have some kind of a outside connection, just to just to tell you that this is okay to feel like this. Other people feel like this too. I think that really helped me kind of on a personal level. Was there a specific Soundgarden album? Uh, I'd have to say Super Unknown. Okay. Yeah, I think pretty much every track on that album meant something to me at one wow. point. Wow, that's great. I, I have very sort of vivid memories of super unknown coming out uh, because it was, I think it was one of the f very first, not the first, but one of the very first CDs that I ever bought um, when I was in high school. And um, there are a lot of really good songs on that album. Um, like the day I tried to live and fresh tendrils and, and or the, the, uh, Fourth of July. Oh, that one gets me every time. A lot of really dark, dark territory there. Uh, mailman, mailman, that one hits me hard. Really, I don't see. I actually don't have any memories of that one, so I'm gonna have to open up Super Unknown and listen to it again. It's kind of a deep cut, but it's uh, I don't know why, but for some reason that one just spoke to me. Okay. The lyrics and the kind of the tone of it. I know there were a couple. There were a couple tracks on that album that just felt like filler, like uh, kick, kick start, jump, uh, kick stand, kick, yeah, kick stand. There you go. Um, Spoon Man, of course, fun song, but yeah, some some of the songs were just more fun than anything. But uh, there was some deeper stuff on it, definitely. Like Suicide is a really deep song. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to give uh, Super Unknown a listen. It's been a very long time. Yeah. Um, the whole story behind uh, like suicide, as I remember, is uh, it's actually about a bird that had flown into Chris Cornell's window. Like the sh window was shut, and it like boom hit the glass and basically broke its neck. Right. And he went outside to go check on it, and it was just like twitching, like half alive. So he just took it down. Right. Finished it. Out of out of mercy. Right. And it affected him that deeply that he wrote a song about it. Yeah, man. Oh, my goodness. Right? <laughs> it's funny, like, when you really dig into this stuff, like, what you can find out, that's what's so beautiful about art to me. You know, as far as, like, you know, growing up and, and having an effect on me, I think Spielberg's work actually really had a big effect on me, especially, like, E.T. Mm-hmm. Because I think that was the first time that uh, that I really felt heart in a movie. Oh, interesting. Do you remember how old you were when you first watched it? Or like what memories um, from what age you were, the memories that you're drawing on for me too? Probably like eight or nine, maybe. Okay. Kind of old enough to understand what the story was, and what the char who the characters were, but not um, not so old to lose the possibility of it being real. You know? Right, right. <laughs> Like, I could find an alien in my backyard. Why not? <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just, there's something so beautiful about that movie. And it's a really hard movie to watch because it's all, it, you know, it's all about finding this relationship and being close to this other being, person, thing, and then having to let it go. Right. Kind of old yeller in that way. You know? Yeah, totally. But also kind of life. 
Right. You know? So, <laughs> yeah, it's like... You make you know, that, great that friends, but, but they don't always last. Yeah. And they, they occupy a time in your life, and then, and then uh, for whatever reason, people change, people grow, people move. You have to say goodbye. And it's the kind of lesson that you can learn it when you're younger, but then you keep relearning it as you get older. Right. And it uh, rarely hurts less. Yeah. When you connect with people and have to say goodbye to them. Yep. Yeah. Just as poignant every time. Right. And that's, you know, it's unfortunate, but some people just like, it cuts so deep, man. They can't deal with it anymore. They close themselves off. Yeah. Or, that's a, that's a rough place to be. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about stuff like that with, uh, with my dog, like, uh, my last dog, uh, broke my heart when I had to put him, put him down and like Darla that I've got this dog that I've got now, like she's going to absolutely, it's going to absolutely crush me when I have to say goodbye to her to the point where, uh, I'm like, optimistically, I'm going to be in my fifties when I have to say goodbye to her. Like, I don't know that I'm going to be able to deal with that kind of stuff again. So like, I might not ever get another dog or, or I might be like, uh, I can't live without a dog and have to get a dog, but that just means I'm going to put myself through it again. Yeah. That's, that's the tough part. My, uh, my older cat, he's 14 now and he's part feral Maine Coon. Right. So, and he's already showing big signs of arthritis and temper. And so we don't know how long he's got left, you know, a couple of years, right. maybe. But that's going to be really hard to say goodbye to him because we, we've had him since he was a little kitten. Right. You know, we've raised him since he was like a month old. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say goodbye. Yeah. And it, uh, I don't, I don't know that it matters whether it gets easier or not, but I don't think it does. I don't think it ever gets easier to say goodbye to someone you love. Yeah. And, um, all right. So we've got uh, Chris Cornell and Steven Spielberg. <laughs> we, need a, we need a third artist that influenced you, Sean. Let, let, let's do something a little happier now. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Palin. <laughs> um, I think in terms of writing, one of the biggest influences on me was uh, David and Lee Eddings. Okay. Specifically the Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. I started reading that, I think, when I was 11 or 12. And I just tore through the whole series, you know, and I, like, I was waiting for the next books to come out, you know, in the next series. And after that, uh, it just, I think that, uh, that taught me to, it kind of opened my eyes to like the people behind the characters because they, they develop their characters very well. There's a lot of nuance in the, in a lot of those characters and it, you know, as a kid, you're watching cartoons and you're seeing these silly movies and they're just like pictures on a screen, you know? But then when you actually get inside their heads and you can feel what they feel, they become real to you. And I think that's what sort of hooked me into storytelling because I want to be able to, to make other people feel that too. So what's your favorite story, man, in any medium? doesn't matter. I don't know. That's, that's something that changes constantly. <laughs> like every time I see something new that I haven't seen before, if I fall in love with it, it's my new favorite thing, you know? Okay. Uh, I mean, that's, that's fair, right? Like all time favorite. Um, I actually recently watched Avatar. Well, that's their Blaze oh, man. Devil. Was it your first time? Yeah. First time I've seen it. I, I caught like, episodes here and there when it was on TV, but I, I didn't actually watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so I didn't quite understand what was going on. Um, but watching it like from beginning to end all the way through, it's fucking brilliant. <laughs> oh, dude. I would like to think that hopefully my recommendation is responsible for you watching that <laughs> at least somewhat. You helped pressure me into doing something I was already thinking of doing. Because <laughs> it, is, it is hands down uh, one of my favorite things ever made. Yeah, like I was impressed with it when I, you know, just saw little bits here and there, but 
watching the whole thing, I'm like, wow, this is why people love it. Yeah, it is a great, great show. I, I cannot speak highly enough of Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm kind of pissed I can't see the Korra. <laughs> uh, why not? Isn't Korra coming out on Netflix this month? Is it? I believe so. Oh, I hadn't heard that. You yeah, might well, want to uh, look it up because I believe that before the end of August, Korra will be on Netflix. Oh, good, good, because they didn't have yeah. it for a while. And I mean, if you want, I've got Korra on Blu-ray if you want to borrow it. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be on Netflix this month. Yeah, I'm going I'm to do that, definitely. Yeah, Korra is good. Um, I like Korra a lot, but I don't, like, love Korra like I love Avatar The Last Airbender. So if we're going to wrap it up here, is there any last words you would want to leave me with? And if not, that's fine. <laughs> it's up to you. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I miss, I miss you too, talking, dude. I miss, I miss hanging out. Yeah, I know. We live in weird times. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, I mean, I'm kind of crossing my fingers that maybe seven months from now, we can have a somewhat normal, a return to a somewhat normal uh, United States of America. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't want this to go political. So right. I'm going to nip that in the bud right there. Thank you, Sean, so much for joining me on Influence and Dimash. Absolutely. It was great to talk to you. Do you have uh, any recommendations of where people can go to view your content? But we do have uh, minddungeon.com where we've got uh, the interviews with the different characters. So that's kind of fun to watch. And that's enterthemindungeon.com? Okay, super cool. All right, Sean, thank you so much for joining me. It's, it's been good to have you. Thank you for having me, Ken.